Welcome everyone. My name is Maria Lucia Uribe. I'm the director of Arigato International uh, Geneva and I will be the moderator of this uh, session. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I think from the different locations where you are joining us, a very warm welcome to everyone. So today uh, in this uh, live chat, uh, we'll be talking about the uh, um, bridging the gaps on ethical foundations of online teaching and learning pedagogies. And this is taking place as part of the preparation for the global online conference organized by Globethics on building new bridges together, strengthening ethics in higher education after COVID-19, which will take place next week on the 25th of June. So just before we start, uh, just let me point you to a, a few technical uh, aspects. So please keep your microphones uh, muted. I think it's very nice that we can see uh, each other's cameras. And, and that's, I think it's, it's enough for, for, for now, but for the microphone, so please keep your microphones uh, muted so we don't disturb our uh, panelists. And, and then feel free to introduce yourselves on the chat and ask also the, the questions on the chat. Each panelist will have seven minutes to speak. And so we hope that in half an hour, we will be uh, ready to initiate some dialogue with your questions and have a, a, a very uh, entertaining and enriching dialogue with all of you. On this live session, we will be listening to four panelists that will help us reflect on the challenges and opportunities of moving to online learning, where are the ethical questions that we need to ask and respond to in terms of inclusive access, preparedness, equity, quality, transparency, to ensure that learning can be facilitated to respond to the new global situation we are experiencing. Uh, in this uh, learning track of, the, of this uh, preparatory meeting, we will be deepening uh, a few questions. How can we close the digital gap that we are seeing uh, that is becoming very marked during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? What kind of pedagogical theories help us to navigate between on-site and online learning environments? And which ethical foundations do institutions need to build and to take seriously when proposing online education? So these are very critical questions as we are experiencing today, the COVID-19 and 1.5 billion children also out of school, uh, universities, trying to, to find a way to cope with these uh, challenges. And so we will have uh, four panelists from uh, different locations, Romania, India, Indonesia, and Democratic Republic of Congo, who will be presenting their research uh, from their own uh, countries and, and giving us some uh, perspective and light on, this, uh, on these thematics and, and what are the findings they have from their research and propose some solutions, if possible, to, to this thematic. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first uh, panelist, Dr. Otilia Manta from Romania. Uh, welcome, Dr. Manta, to, to be here with us. It's a Thank pleasure you very much. to you with us. Dr. Manta is scientific researcher, assistant professor from the Instituto Ricerca da Fez Turino in Italy. Uh, university lecturer of the Ateneo University in Bucharest, Romania, assistant professor of the Romanian American University, EU expert and rapporteur of the European Commission, and founder and president of the Romanian Group for Investment and Consultancy. And Dr. Manta will be talking about current challenges in the higher education system in the context of digitalization and international, internationalization. Dr. Manta, you have seven minutes. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I want, first of all, I want to thank you very much for uh, Globe Ethics, uh, for this opportunity to give some idea in my concept for current challenger in the higher education system in the context of digitalization and internationalization. Because all of us, we know the to build the capacity in um, uh, higher education school is very important to understand exactly what is the tools in this moment and uh, what will be the next uh, stage in the current model of education, which are based on the current resources available 
to the both of the education system and the artificial intelligence system, both in close independence with uh, existing global needs technology in one of them. Moreover, uh, we believe that more and more in um, uh, this kind of resources, the place of the human factor is replaced uh, by artificial intelligence. And uh, in this case, I, um, I uh, have the, the um, uh, in my idea, it's uh, because the, the primary uh, uh, people which work in the primary, uh, primary activities will be uh, changed with the robotics uh, component in the world. Uh, next a way of the approaching and coordinating education aim to increase the flexibility of the actor involved in education, especially virtual education network. Um, many institutions in this uh, period of COVID um, has changed the, the, the platform uh, from the traditional way to do the training support in the virtual way with the tools uh, uh, by uh, internet. And um, what I want to put it in this, um, in my research, I want to put it the core curriculum with also respect a, a key EU uh, competence. The first key, communication skills in the mother uh, two languages of international circulation. The second uh, competence is fundamental skills in mathematics, science and technology. The third, digital skills use uh, information technology for knowledge and problem solving. Uh, the fourth uh, competence, axiological or, uh, valorization skills necessary for active and responsible participation in social life. A uh, five competence, skills for management, personal life and professional development. The sixth competence, uh, entrepreneur skills and financial education, which is very important to uh, put it not just in higher education school, also in primary schools. Uh, competence of court, uh, uh, culture uh, expression um, and eight long life learning skills. We know in um, 1916, the professor um, uh, who put it uh, long life learning in the first moment uh, like a concept in the research. The competence will be applied in the all area uh, driver from priority international education programs, but also for the other components of the curriculum. The curriculum design formula respect both the needs of the international market, the needs of the cultural conservation, the needs of local development and especially, especially the needs of personal development. Uh, in my research, which you have it um, uh, in, uh, in your portfolio of presentation, uh, I have it also some statistical um, uh, points and also what means artificial intelligence versus uh, robotics for the education system. But I want to refer just uh, um, the clunk, because we know the time is uh, our, um, our good friend. I put some conclusion. Uh, artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence in the field of education in the university environment is still in the beginning uh, of uh, lying the foundation, especially because networks are found, especially in the virtual space. And so, uh, the multiply, multiply changes and vulnerability, because we know we don't have regulation included in virtual sp space, included also education system, also financing system. Uh, however, uh, thanks to the digital technology, uh, di digital technolo uh, technologization, because they are part of the, our current life in this moment. And we believe that uh, artificial intelligence will become predominantly creating in ecosystem complex, but higher education model of the system. Uh, take the education in the cost, uh, context, for example, GlobTech, uh, which will be the next concept in our life. Uh, GlobTech included the, the artificial intelligence, 
uh, the tools of the education which uh, which are part of the, our life in this moment um, Doctor, uh, Doctor, one minute more oh, okay uh, I just uh, uh, last uh, my affirmation um, we, uh, we we appreciate that artificial intelligence combined with the internet of things we results in physical things become more adaptive and uh, receptive, extended uh, the useful uh, lives. Uh, what what uh, we believe, we, we don't have finally conclusion to things, uh, what will be happened uh, with artificial intelligence uh, in, uh, in uh, education. For example, uh, Stephen, uh, Professor Stephen uh, Hems uh, put it, uh, we still don't know what will be the good model uh, in education included artificial intelligence. But what is very important for us is to use all the tools to facilitate uh, more easy life for our students. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mant. I think this is fascinating, this uh, new uh, space for artificial in, uh, intelligence and how you see this as moving forward and as a part of also the competencies uh, uh, that teachers need to develop in, in moving uh, forward in the future. So I would like to see if there are uh, comments for you so we facilitate maybe some dialogue and maybe some clarifications. Christine, do we have any questions from the participants or? So far, we, we don't have questions. We do have one proposal um, uh, on outcome-based education. And so we have some expertise on outcome-based education amongst us. Please feel free to indicate questions or comments for our speaker. So from Amelie, we have, is it not important in this context to particularly pay attention to ethical founda foundations? And a related question, um, is there any country as leader on AI on education? Um, to, to be honest with you, exists not just one country which uh, um, have particular issue in the education system, included artificial intelligence. We have it in United States, we have it in uh, China, we have it in uh, also in Africa exist some instruments uh, with uh, artificial intelligence for the, uh, for the students. But what is very important, important is because the European Union put it eight competence, included also artificial intelligence to build capacity in higher education uh, school. This, I believe, for us is very important to respect, uh, respect all the rules and to include it to facilitate more easy the, the life uh, of the students and to increase the, the, the capacity uh, building in our education. From Dr. Zohar Gadiali, how do we include rural areas which do not have online facilities, adequate online facilities? Uh, it's a good question and thank you very much because the infrastructure to, to, to include it, the tools uh, in some of the areas does exist good uh, IT infrastructure. But um, uh, important uh, because, uh, uh, okay, to, to, to put it traditional education in uh, versus um, um, education with digitalization instruments. It's, it's very important to understand uh, the, the, finally the results. Results not just for the students, included also financial results because uh, to use the tools uh, with, uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, uh, the, the final cost for the students will be more uh, uh, more, uh, not uh, higher, will be more um, uh, low. And uh, this, I believe, it's very important to understand all uh, the uh, I actors, not just us, like uh, professors, also authorities. It's very important to, to uh, understand what it's finally results for the new generation, because the new generation will be uh, for, uh, for, uh, will be real our support. 
and and I, I go back to the the earlier question um, about an ethical foundation in this context. Is it important to pay attention to ethical foundations? Um, uh, the the gold foundation in uh, uh, people do the things. In my opinion, the gold foundation is uh, to have uh, real people to put it in the foundation. Uh, to create uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, things. We have um, a question. What do we do with teachers that are not formed? And will AI threaten the jobs of lecturers? Um, good question. I thank you very much. All, all, uh, to be honest with uh, you, also me, when I started in the internet, to do my training for my students, I said, uh, okay, how many students I have? Because uh, I, 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 I don't know what will do next step in my life. Uh, but uh, like uh, Professor uh, Wenson uh, said in 96, long life learning, it's an instrument for our life. Uh, all of us is very important to understand. Uh, we, we don't stay uh, to, to be adapted to all the changes because, okay, uh, today I'm the professor, tomorrow it's possible to be uh, uh, the, the entrepreneur in the training support to teach the people to the new competence. Uh, important is to be uh, open in the life, to, to understand, uh, okay, uh, my job is to, to teach the people, not to just the, the, uh, the students and uh, in this um, uh, change it is very important to be adapted for the for the new uh, changes in the the uh, in the university in the environment and uh, also in our life. Can robots really replace teachers? Oh, uh, robots is possible to to change, but in different science is not possible to change. For example, when we have it uh, exactly, uh, I don't know, for example, uh, you, you know, was a big question in a research gate platform um, with artificial intelligence. The mathematics uh, discipline is possible to change uh, with the robotics. And one of the professors said no, because it uh, depends exactly what kind of algorithm we put it. It's possible for prediction to have it robotics uh, inside, but uh, uh, in the to interpretation, all the results is not possible to do uh, only for uh, with 100% uh, robotics. It's, uh, it's very important to combine because the artificial intelligence with the human uh, intelligence all the, the time will be, will be the combination, not, not uh, will be separate. So we have um, just a comment and I'll pass it back to our moderator as our question time is coming to an end. We have questions around um, the future, you know, when we have more going back to more in person, will students prefer uh, online? Uh, what kinds of blended models will we see? And we see several questions around um, ethics, the ethics of the situation, which have to do with the goals and values that, that we have in our education systems. Back to Maria Lucia. Thank you, Christine, and thank you, uh, Dr. Mant. I think this is a, a very uh, interesting, and as I hear Dr. Manta also saying, I think it's very thinking of the teacher's uh, profession if artificial intelligence were to take uh, over in a way in the future. So it's very interesting the ethical implications this can have in the future. And I see the concerns in the chat from our participants. So very interesting reflection. So I would like to move to our second uh, panelist. And this is uh, Professor, Professor Diki Sofian from Indonesia. Core, core doctoral faculty in the Indonesia Consortium for Religious Studies based in the Graduate School of Universities Gajamada in Yogyakarta. And Dr. Uh, Sofian is going to talk about fairness and equ equitable access to higher education using online pedagogies. Dr. Sofian, uh, you have seven minutes. Welcome. 
Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for the fine introduction. Um, I would just like to thank, uh, first of all, the Globe Ethics team for the invitation to partake in this exciting endeavor, you know, looking at the ethical foundations for higher learning pedagogies. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say that this current COVID-19 pandemic, which has gone on for more than three months now, has allowed many of us to sort of reflect on our own vulnerabilities and shortcomings uh, as a society. Uh, it made us realize how a virus can change, you know, the world, our routines, our habits, um, our daily activities, our hobbies, and what have you. But the global pandemic has also uh, sort of exposed us to the uh, inequalities and the socioeconomic injustices. And hence, I think this is where the ethical foundations need to be directly uh, confronted. And as you'll see in my um, later argument that, uh, you know, the cost of education and the type of learning opportunities uh, which we can learn from uh, online um, pedagogies uh, could look quite different from what we have traditionally and conventionally seen in higher educational institutions. Uh, we have also seen how this pandemic has resulted in the closure of schools and universities. According to a recent UNESCO uh, data, I think 75% of uh, the student population around the world have been negatively affected or been affected by the closure of their schools and universities. And so despite all of these uh, technological advancements, uh, you know, space explorations and the breakthroughs in molecular biology, and as the earlier speaker had um, spoken of, you know, the inter and big data analytics and artificial intelligence and so on, we remember to even the things that are sort of, uh, you know, invisible to our naked eyes. But one of the things that we learned uh, from the COVID-19 pandemic is that no country was truly prepared for what was to come. Not even the United Nations, the World Health Organization, governments, medical industry, health professionals, researchers, hospitals, and more so, I think, higher educational institutions. Um, a global pandemic uh, that is non-discriminatory, I think, has also given us this uh, sort of idea uh, that perhaps we need to look at the world in a different way and look at society in a different way. Meaning that there is probably something that we had overlooked, something that went beyond our scope of interest all this time. And what this tells me is that we were not focusing on the right kind of questions or problems. For instance, immediately after the lockdown or what you call the large scale social restrictions as we call it in Indonesia, we had many uh, you know, people and members of the society feeling distraught because they were laid off and, and had lost their income. And the hardest hit were the daily wage earners or laborers and contractors whose work relied on being physically present on a day-to-day -day basis. So due to these restrictions and stay-at-home orders, they could no longer work and get income. Uh, I think this has transpired to yet another potential problem that we in the university had not anticipated, yeah? which is the hunger pandemic or the food insecurity, as it were, for some segments of society. And so we have seen you know, citizens falling through the cracks and uh, not being attended to uh, you know, uh, fairly well. Thus, as I reflect on all of these, I came to the conclusion that we in the higher educational institutions are not accustomed to focusing our attention on those who fall through the cracks. You know, I think mainly because we tend to think of universities as a place of privilege and a habitat for those you know, hardworking people who have the means to pay off student debt or can afford the increasingly um, high tuitions. Universities therefore seem to have become an institution for the privileged few. Hence those who are from the lower middle income bracket families find it extremely hard to experience upward mobility. So uh, this has to change, I think, immediately. And uh, we want to make sure that our universities stay relevant and become part of the solution for society and not add to the already unfair and, and unequal playing field in society. I've been inspired by Gunnar Mildel's uh, idea uh, about 
uh, this cumulative causation, you know, where positive change can, in one institution could also lead to other changes in other institutions, you know, affecting society, affecting uh, the labor market, the economics, business, finance, culture, housing, uh, residential areas, and many other things. So I've seen throughout this pandemic how difficult it is for all of us to adapt and adopt these new ways of learning and teaching using these different technological platforms at our disposal, whether it be Zoom, uh, you know, Google uh, Meet, and uh, others, uh, Microsoft Teams, you know. Um, and then there's also this sort of uh, intergenerational gap between the learners who may be millennials and are therefore much more adaptive than the teachers or professors. But above and beyond the sort of level of te technological savviness of the users, there are also other issues related to fairness and equity in higher education using online pedagogies. But one is obviously the issue. Uh, one of minute uh, more. Uh, sorry to interrupt. You have one minute more. Yes. Uh, well, first is, is the digital divide. Uh, and I'm not just talking about access to the technology, but also the ability to sort of use and, and overexhaust the different technological platforms at their disposals. You know, so the use of 3Gs, 4Gs, 5Gs do make a difference in terms of the learning experience of the students and also the uh, professors and lecturers who are teaching the courses. And then the cost of learning, you know, internet quotas are very expensive still in Indonesia and I'm, so, I'm sure in other countries as well. You know, a one week internet quota can be finished in a two hour Zoom online course. For instance, and you can just imagine if students were taking three, five, or seven classes in one semester. And then, of course, the accessibility uh, issue, you know, where students, uh, you know, can go online and take up um, courses and classes. This obviously will provide much more, uh, you know, uh, accessibility for those who are, you know, from the lower income uh, class and those who are already in the professional uh, world. Uh, but the most important thing, I think, is, is that the online pedagogy also provides opportunities for a global inclusive education. In other words, uh, I think it's high time to conduct more experimentation on online, intercultural, interreligious and international mode of learning, just like what we are doing right now, you know. This, of course, allows students and learners to be exposed to sort of the non-dominant theories and non-conventional views and perspectives from other people from around the world. Thank and hence, you so much, Dr. Uh, Sofia. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm really sorry, I, and Kathy, you, I know that how difficult it is, and this is fascinating. And, and you have been mentioning all these very concrete challenges. And, and I think one very important point is where it really was really education prepared to this. And I think, as you mentioned, it has shown the many, has made visible the already inequalities and inequities in our societies and, and how education uh, has not responded to this in, in proper ways. I would like now to invite uh, our listener. So in each of these preparatory meetings, we have a listener who is taking notes of all this and making connections. And, and she will be presenting during the conference next week, the findings and reflections from this session. So I would like to introduce Dr. Mary Doyle Roche from the United States, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Religious Studies of the College of the Holy Cross in Massachusetts. Dr. Roche, you have three minutes and I know it's challenging. So thank you so much. Great, thank you, and thanks for the um, opportunity to listen and report back. Um, so uh, this has been just a fascinating conversation, and um, I attended yesterday as well, and I really see sort of bridges from yesterday's uh, session. You know, one of the things that um, uh, that really struck me about yesterday was the sense in which people wanted to move in this context from students as degree seekers to change makers, right? And I think one of the things about today um, is also, I think, asking us to see how with the degree and the experience that we have, what kind of change makers are we going to be in the field of higher ed and in our own disciplines, right? Um, 
And what I heard this morning, so I guess what I would want to, uh, the sort of the threads that I'm trying to pull together um, from the first uh, two presentations, right, have to do with um, really some fundamental questions about the human, right? What is sort of the kind of our anthropological vision, right, of who is the human person fully alive and flourishing, um, and how, um, you know, in the, in the case of Otilia's presentation, right, how does technology serve that, right? How does that serve human persons and communities, not the other way around, right? Not how human persons and communities serve a kind of a technological and maybe technocratic kind of um, uh, sort of architecture, right? Um, and so that was that really uh, struck me as sort of the some of the question that was at the heart of this, right? Because we were asking questions about could AI replace professors? That made me ask, could they replace students? If they're replacing if they're replacing human capital and human labor in other industries. Right. Um, what's the future for our students and and their learning. Right. Um, I think the other uh, one of the other pieces um, was definitely we were not ready. We were not ready. Right. As Dickie said. Um, and I'm in the United States. We have a lot of acts. It's dis. it's not equal or uh, there's not a lot of equity here, but there's a lot of technology and we were still not ready. And it was because we were asking the wrong questions. And I think some of the questions that we want to be asking now, um, and in terms of the ethical foundation and this anthropological vision, right, is um, remembering that with all of the technological advancement and all of the digital uh, ways in which we will conduct our research and our teaching, there is a human being on the other end of that. In the United States, we are wrestling with essential workers, right, who have become expendable. Um, and I think holding those people up. So human dignity and solidarity. Uh, and um, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Dr. Roche. Very to the three point, uh, three minutes. That's very good and very good reflections. And I would like to invite our third uh, panelist, Dr. Rekha Sudhanda from India and, and she is working with the Gopichan Arya Mahila College, Abu Har, Punjabi, India. And Dr. Sudhanda will talk about the pedagogical shift in higher education during the COVID-19, a case study of Abu Har. Dr. Sudhanda, welcome and you have seven minutes. Thank you, thank you dear. Myself, Dr. Ekha Sudhanda, I greeting to all of you on the day and organizers as well as one and all present, moderator, listener, rapporteur. At the same time, I steal the opportunity to say a word of thanks to the Global Ethics Conference to take such initiative. And I would like if you kindly share my virtual PPT on screen. Uh, my topic is, as already been told, pedagogical shift in higher education during COVID-19, a case study of Abuha. So far as my paper is concerned, it is a micro study. I have tried to trace out the pedagogical shift during COVID-19 with special reference to an area which is in Punjab and small town comprising about almost 2 lakh 11,645 population with 1 lakh 45,302 urban as well as 66,243. It is a cosmopolitan area. Various languages are being used. There, there are uh, dialects are being used. So it, it was really difficult situation immediately to be shifted from uh, offline to online. So if the objective of the paper was to investigate the effects of the significant event on uh, teaching and learning. And you know that uh, this was really a headache for the teachers as well as the students to go from uh, chalk and to talk to immediate online. So there is a, 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 a literate person, Samuel Beckett, in 18, 19, uh, sorry, 1957 has said that uh, if one person is having head, headache, uh, what he needs, he has to choose or provide his own aspirin. So 
uh, the, here lies the problem. Here I, I just wanted to investigate the effects of significant event on teaching and learning, and at the same time to trace the microscopic effect of the COVID-19 on higher education. So uh, the methodology was being adopted uh, that uh, uh, two questionnaires uh, simultaneously were, were prepared. One questionnaire was for the teachers who were uh, uh, teaching uh, or who had shifted to the online immediately and second was the, for the students. So the research plan was, uh, you know, that I have told that this is a small area and uh, there were eight UG colleges and there are uh, 10 professional and training institutes with 535 teachers almost and 12,500 students. And uh, uh, this this really made made me troubled because I, I am in an administrative post, I'm a principal, and I knew that the students uh, are having their own problems and teachers are having their own problems. This problem led me to think that uh, if we are educationists, if we really think about the students to be given actual uh, learning, and if we, we teachers uh, uh, are providing them and either the students are, and the teachers are satisfied. This, this was the real question for me. And uh, then uh, we go for a questionnaire and that questionnaire was being responded by 132 teachers. And uh, out of which there was 80.6 assistant professors, 12.2 associate professors, 4% were the professors, and 3.2% were the principals. And they, and they provided a feedback which really come to my hypothetical view. I was thinking that uh, here, the, here in the area of Abuhar, the students are not, uh, teachers and students, both are not ready to accept the things. Same happened. And uh, the, when we go for the data, data says that classroom teaching is the most per preferred one with the 73.4 teachers preferred online teaching while 26.6 are more comfort with, uh, comfortable with the online, online teaching. Most of the teachers considered that all students participated through online teaching while the less of the teachers think not all the students were involved in online teaching. The proportion here is of 61 0.5% agreeing to the participation of the students in online teaching and the rest of the 38.5 disagreeing with the same. Next, educators feedback. Actually, the slides are not going according to my uh, lecture. Please see the slides. Uh, slide is going that educators feedback. Uh, percentages 41.1 teachers found it good, 31.3 teachers found it average, 24.6 found it excellent. On the other side, um, it, that when they were asked, will you prefer online teaching in future, the result was uh, this one, 45.2% teacher agreed to prefer online teaching in future, 13.3% completely disagreed, and 39.3% may or may not go for that. And it is really because uh, you know that teachers are of different age group and they, according to their age group, consider the things. Then, uh, what about the students' response? It was the second part of the study in which the students reported. And so we take the data of two. You have one minute. Uh, apologies for interrupting oh. you. You have one minute. So, uh, sorry, so I'm going to complete it. 81.1 percent students had smartphone, and 18.9 point students do not have smartphone. <coughs> so, for the rating of the teachers. 45% teachers uh, found it good, 30% found it ex excellent, 15% found it average, and 8% found it bad. Uh, now the conclusions, uh, rating of the teachers, 70% of the students gave excellent rating to the teachers in understanding through a video lecture, 25% gave it average, 5% found it poor. Uh, so my conclusions are there. Maintaining and managing higher education ethics has always remained a challenging task everywhere during pandemic. A lot of changes have been observed in the 
pedagogy of the teaching and learning in the colleges of abohor the teachers immediately shifted from traditional to virtual learning covid 19 offered opportunities to collaborate and share knowledge with the students online but as interpreted data suggests that neither teachers nor students were 100% happy and satisfied due to various ecological social technical troubles for the quantitative and qualitative growth of higher education and to maintain the ethics of the teaching community it it is mandatory to train through workshops orientation courses and refresh courses so i thank you to the organizing committee of the global ethics international conference for organizing such conference and word of thanks is due for all the teachers and students who took time to complete digital questionnaire stay safe stay happy stay healthy stay home and keep distancing thank you thank you so much uh, professor suhanda uh, i think thank you this is very uh, important that you have done the survey with uh, the teachers the students that you know it's based on the experience and trying to listen also to the needs and and, and feelings of people and teachers during this period so i think this is very uh, relevant I would like now to, to open for a few questions and answers. Uh, Christine, I think the chat is it's very busy with many uh, questions. So please go ahead and share with us some of those questions. All right, thank you. We have a couple of themes emerging and perhaps we could invite uh, Professor Dickie Sofjan and then Dr. Rekha Sudhanda to, to give a response um, to, I, I, will, I will just, mention a couple of themes and then why don't you choose which one you would like to address. And so there is concern about the way in which online teaching has amplified social inequality in poor countries. Um, education is supposed to be the great equalizer, but because of the digital divide, it seems that the new normal in education is an obstacle to social equality. What do you think? And I think this one would be a, a great question following Professor Dickey's um, presentation. Perhaps why don't I stop there and then after you answer, come back. Yes, well, um, thank you very much for the uh, question. I appreciate that. And this has been one of uh, the concerns that I've been thinking about as well. You know, um, as much as, uh, you know, Indonesians are quite uh, socially connected uh, through uh, social media, I think we are the second or third largest, um, you know, uh, Facebook account users in the world. And I think uh, the first or second among uh, Twitter users in the world. Uh, but uh, there are still discrepancies in the different provinces and cities you know, we have uh, 34 provinces and around 450 districts, um, you know, in this wide archipelago, we have three time zones. And so some of these areas are quite remote. Some of them are, you know, the deep rainforest. Some of them are, you know, uh, tiny islands um, off of the major islands of Indonesia. And so you can just imagine the uh, sort of infrastructure structural uh, challenges that we have to overcome in terms of facilitating, um, you know, an internet system uh, for everyone throughout the country. Um, but I must say that uh, costing is, uh, you know, uh, is the one that makes uh, a whole lot of difference, you know. As I mentioned earlier, that internet quotas are still very expensive and students and learners usually don't necessarily have the means to have a Wi-Fi system in their homes or in their uh, private accommodations, you know, because after all, it's, it's only a temporary uh, resident, residential center for them and not their sort of uh, regular home. And so, uh, you know, internet quotas uh, can uh, run deep in, in the pockets of students and learners. So I think this is one of the uh, issues of inequality. The other one... Uh, okay, just think, in, in 30 seconds. Yes, uh, the other one concerns the uh, ability uh, of, of people to actually use and exhaust the 
uh, technological platforms, as I mentioned. And I think this is also uh, creating some um, unequal effects, which means that the learning process of the students and learners will be very different from one person to the next. So depending on his or her socioeconomic status and upbringing and environment, family, and so on and so forth. Um, just following on that, um, we, we, have to, we have to be equipped and our level of being equipped is different. And so to Dr. Rekha Sudhanda, as an administratrice, um, will faculty have to be equipped to handle online pedagogies? And what, what are your reflections and recommendations from your experience? P please unmute yourself. Done, done. Uh, this is a very nice question here. And uh, you know that uh, we, we are going to provide uh, a suggestion to the government body as well as uh, the universities that all the teachers uh, should be given training first. That they, were, they are being either joined, uh, joined uh, these classes, uh, like uh, training classes, orientation courses, refresher courses, uh, that they should first be prone to have learning. Secondly, the student should be provided either any device, uh, either they are being provided laptops or uh, mobiles, because already you are talking about uh, socioeconomic differences. In India, the same thing is there. There are major portion uh, in our area, not only in our area, in total India, uh, there are many people who are not having students. They are not having uh, mobiles with them, smartphones with them. How can they learn? How they can go for online teaching? In the classrooms, uh, I was always uh, in the uh, like my meetings, uh, asking my staff uh, to provide students flipped classroom. But there was difficulty. What was the difficulty? The students were not having smartphones. How could they? And this few parents are laborers. So in future, I just want that each and every student should be provided a facility. And, and one more thing, internet problem. This internet problem is so severe. I was thinking whether I would be able to take the whole conference or not. I'm very lucky that today the um, online, uh, this internet is working properly. So these two particular things, one, uh, to provide training to the teachers, second to provide infrastructural things to the students. This is uh, going to be there. This will definitely add to the uh, teaching, learning, or pedagogical shift proper. Thank you so much, Professor Sutanda. And with this, I'm going to move to our last um, panelist. And this is Dr. Kawa Jojo from the Democratic Republic of Congo. He's the rector of the Anglican University Apollo Kibebulaya of Butembo in the province of North Kivu in, Do in, in DRC Congo, also professor at the Anglican University of Congo. The topic of his presentation is a pedagogical perspective on experience in, experiences in higher education in the Democratic Republic of Congo, issues, visions, and avenues for reflection on objectives in higher education. Dr. George is going to be presenting in French, and we will have uh, some slides in English for us to follow the, the presentation. Dr. George, you have seven minutes. Please go ahead. Bienvenue. Uh, vous avez sept minutes. Dr. George, est-ce que vous êtes prêt? Oui, c'est pour moi une grande joie de vous présenter quelques expériences dans l'enseignement supérieur au Congo dans une perspective pédagogique. Et je vais me focaliser sur les enjeux, la vision et les pistes de réflexion sur les objectifs de l'enseignement supérieur. Étant en pleine mutation économique, politique, sociale et culturelle, le Congo fait face à plusieurs enjeux affectant tous les secteurs du système d'enseignement supérieur. 
Ces défis impactent négativement à la fois le fonctionnement interne de l'enseignement, l'organisation du système d'enseignement et son interaction avec les étudiants et la société. Alors, pour ce qui est des enjeux dans l'enseignement supérieur, il y a une vingtaine d'années que la situation dans l'enseignement supérieur au Congo est alarmante. On peut noter quelques facteurs de la non-performance dans l'enseignement supérieur. Et sur le plan organisationnel, accroissement incontrôlé des nombres d'institutions d'enseignement supérieur, quelques-unes sans ressources humaines et financières suffisantes, et d'autres ont été créées sans études de faisabilité qui prouvent leur capacité de donner un enseignement de qualité aux étudiants. Sur le plan praxéologique, nous avons par exemple accroissement non planifié d'inscription d'une pléthore d'étudiants dans des locaux inadaptés et mal équipés. Et nous avons aussi les programmes et méthodes d'enseignement basés sur la théorie. Et presque, il n'y a pas de pratique. Il y a aussi la corruption, la corruption qui contrôle tous les secteurs de l'enseignement supérieur avec un impact négatif sur le niveau éducationnel des apprenants ou des étudiants. Et pour ce qui est de la vision de l'enseignement supérieur au Congo, dans le cadre de l'enseignement supérieur, le Congo se fixe la vision de construire un enseignement d'éducation inclusif et de qualité contribuant efficacement à la croissance économique, à la lutte contre la pauvreté et à la promotion de la paix et d'une citoyenneté démocratique active. La finalité du système éducatif est de former des hommes et des femmes compétents et à la connaissance, l'expertise et des compétences pour pouvant leur permettre de participer efficacement au développement du pays. Alors, nous avons retenu quelques pistes de réflexion afin de, de contribuer à l'amélioration du système éducatif dans l'enseignement supérieur au Congo. Nous avons noté quelques pistes. D'abord, nous voulons faire de l'éducation supérieure accessible à tout le monde et sans discrimination. Nous voulons aussi à ce que l'on puisse améliorer la qualité de l'enseignement en poursuivant l'efficience organisationnelle et l'efficience pratique. Il faut aussi rénover le contenu des programmes et des méthodes de pédagogiques pour que les étudiants deviennent intrinsèquement autonomes dans leur vie. Ce contenu et ces méthodes doivent être adaptés aux besoins nationaux et internationaux des étudiants ou des apprenants. Il faut aussi affecter les enseignants bien sélectionnés mettant l'étudiant au cœur de leur profession. Il faut établir des critères dans l'engagement ou dans l'affectation des enseignants compétents en tenant compte de leurs connaissances et aussi de leurs valeurs. Il faut aussi diversifier les programmes afin de répondre aux besoins au niveau national et aussi au niveau international. Et enfin, il faut améliorer les nouvelles techniques d'information et de communication au sein des établissements de formation afin de faciliter un échange au niveau interinstitutionnel, au niveau national et aussi au niveau international. Alors nous avons présenté en résumé quelques expériences et sur notre donc l'expérience sur le système éducatif au Congo et je crois que les questions et les remarques sont les bienvenues. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Dr. Giorgio. Um, I'm seeing uh, several questions uh, here, um, and um, so maybe Christine, you can help me with one. I have I have a lot of uh, in the chat, and if you can help me, maybe we we'll start there while I collect here the questions, please. Okay, sure. Well, 
we have um, we have a proposal that education, you know, in in response to this challenge of inequity, we have a proposal that education, government, and internet service providers must work together to provide internet at little or no cost in the educational sector if we're to take this seriously and if online education is going to be you know, uh, part of the new normal, maybe part of a blended model. And so that's very helpful as a, you know, as a proposal into this um, methodology. Do, do um, perhaps our, our last speaker, Dr. No Jojo Kawa, do you have a response to that? Je ne vous ai pas bien capté. La question, c'est sur quoi? Maybe Amélie? La question était à savoir si peut-être des modèles pédagogiques intégrés, c'est-à-dire qui, euh, qui, qui concilient euh, les méthodes d'enseignement en ligne, euh, et euh, de présence euh, serait euh, une voie à poursuivre dans ce contexte qu'on discute. Oui, oui je crois que c'est une bonne proposition parce que, comme je l'ai souligné, dans le système éducatif au Congo, on insiste davantage sur la théorie et et cette théorie est communiquée à travers la distribution des syllabus et, et les syllabus contiennent tout ce qui est nécessaire pour la connaissance et l'apprentissage de, de l'étudiant. Et pourtant, les syllabus ne peuvent pas contenir tous les éléments possibles. On a besoin encore de la pratique, on a besoin de lecture à la bibliothèque et aussi certaines innovations personnelles. Donc, aider l'étudiant à savoir comment il peut innover personnellement les théories qu'il a apprises à l'école et les mettre en pratique pour le bénéfice de soi-même et aussi pour le bénéfice de la société. Donc, les, cette intégration de la théorie ou le lien entre la théorie et la pratique est vraiment important pour que les, les apprenants apprennent à savoir comment ils peuvent être responsables et autonomes dans leur vie scientifique. Perhaps, Amélie, you could give a summary of his response. Mm. It's done. you find this in the okay. comment box. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, well, um, as we're moving to an end, um, there is a comment that online pedagogy is a means and not an end. And I go back to an earlier question, which um, really talks about the role of the teacher. Um, which goes back to what Mary was saying about the human person and really what are we doing here? And so uh, maybe if the moderator would allow and if, um, maybe she can direct this thought, but let me put it out there. Um, you know, if, if um, what, what is the role of, of this pedagogy? How can we use this pedagogy in a human centered way? You know, perhaps that's at the root of the comment and the question. Thank you. So maybe Maria Lucia, would you like to direct that? Uh, it, uh, I think, uh, and Dr. Manta, you mentioned a few uh, of these uh, things uh, before, and you mentioned the changing role of the teacher. So maybe you have some thoughts uh, for this uh, in, a, in a minute. And I would invite um, uh, Dr. Suhanda and uh, Professor Sofian and Dr. Jojo for any final uh, comments um, as we finish the, the webinar. So Dr. Manta, please. The, the humans uh, in pedagogical way, it's, uh, it's in, in the part of the complexity of the phenomenon. It's not just, in, it's not in the center. It's a piece of the complex process. It's very important to use the, the uh, digital tools to facilitate the social balance because I, I see a lot of questions for the people which are in the, the uh, uh, social uh, um, uh, restriction to, to be in the access for the internet with the low uh, possibility to, to access the internet. But, but if we put it in the 
picture all the resources included um, internet materials traditional uh, 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 way uh, manuals books everything you will see exactly what efficiency will be to 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 push the the uh, government support for the tools for the internet for the channels for the to 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 be facilitate for the people which uh, very social to the poor people uh, to be access uh, in a higher education school because for example in in my uh, um, in my university uh, i have a good uh, moment to be honest with you all the people have uh, smartphone uh, internet and i i have many students uh, in my uh, uh, in my um, uh, courses but uh, i understand exactly the point of uh, view by the professors from india from indonesia which uh, have limited internet resources for a participant. It's very important to put it in the same picture, all the instruments for education and to create a new model in actual context because we don't be in the past, we'll be just in the future. Mm. Thank you, Dr. Manta. Professor uh, Sofian, very few comments uh, in 30 seconds uh, as a concluding observation from your side. Yes, um, I wholeheartedly agree that the human must come first and equity and justice will obviously come about when human dignity is fully respected. So, you know, in respect to our students and learners, we must uh, always think about how we can uh, bring in the inclusiveness uh, of our pedagogy. And also, I think I'd just like to um, comment for about 30 seconds on the in internet infrastructure and system that needs to be fixed um, very fast. I mean, if we can uh, provide subsidies for book publications, for instance, we could also do the same thing with online uh, methods of learning, if that is uh, truly going to be the way forward. In my university, we have given subsidies to teachers and students uh, for the internet quota, so that would obviously be uh, quite helpful for them, but obviously that is not enough. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Suhanda? Very few uh, comments, that's the final remarks. Yeah, uh, I think this pedagogical shift is uh, very nice, which we are going to learn for 10 years. We learned within two few days. And uh, definitely this is going to make a new venture for the world. And world is going to a uh, small globe actually, a global village. The term actually after COVID-19, it has become very clear that the world has become a real global village. And this pedagogical shift will give trans countries, trans cultural shift, and as well as uh, you see that new things will come into fall. And uh, I think this positivity or positive result is going to add more in the coming uh, times and the coming generations will learn a lot. And I hope uh, the next generation is going to be benefit this particular calamity. <laughs> this calamity, in, actually it is a blessing in disguise. No doubt there are so many pains. No doubt we, we are really having tough times, but it is making us learn. So we have learned the ethics, uh, many ethics, uh, and related to education, societal, and many things are coming uh, natural. You see, uh, environment is so clean. So we are going to uh, add in this particular arena also in the teaching learning. Thank you so much. Dr. Giorgio, is uh, que vous quelques commentaires final? Oui, je voudrais seulement souligner les, les établissements d'enseignement supérieur au Congo doivent s'ouvrir au reste du monde pour connaître ce qui se passe ailleurs en termes de des méthodes, en termes de programmes, et aussi savoir comment tisser des liens avec d'autres universités ou d'autres établissements supérieurs afin de développer un partenariat dans le système éducatif qui convient pour que 
les étudiants au Congo ne se sentent pas dépaysés lorsqu'ils affrontent encore un autre système d'éducation sous d'autres cieux. Merci beaucoup. So we have come to an end to this a very interesting discussion and I think we could have gone uh, much longer because there are many uh, comments and questions and I think it has sparked a lot of reflections starting from the changing role of the teacher and what it means in, in, in online teaching but also the preparedness of the, of the teachers in, in, in this and the attitudes and, and I think not only the preparedness but how teachers feel comfortable doing it uh, online or not. I think a lot has been discussed in terms of access uh, to, to online technologies and the co collaboration with several partners to ensure that there is access to education because of course we can continue talking about pedagogies online but if half of the population do not have access to those online technologies, what are the uh, alternatives? And I think uh, Dr. Giorgio mentioned a lot also in terms of the, the, the role of the student, also the autonomy of the, of the student. And I think part of this changing role of uh, pedagogy and uh, education is how we see the role of the student. And I think a lot and how we see is this very, very vertical approach of the teacher providing the information but here we have seen that the, it, with this change, the student becomes more autonomous in the learning. So what are the ways we need to have and the pedagogies to ensure that this happens? And so I think there is a, a lot to say. I don't intend to <laughs> give a summary of, uh, of this. I just want to thank for this very enriching discussion and I'm sure the, the conclusions and observations that we have made here will make a very good contribution to the meeting uh, next week. And I hope to see all of you uh, on Wednesday, the, the first day, the 25th, for the online conference. And I want to thank Globe Ethics for bringing us together, creating this space for connecting and for sharing our views from all the different places around the world. And so this has been truly a, a very interesting experience sharing from different parts of the world. So thank you so much. And Christine, thank you for, for helping facilitate and Dr. Roche also for the for listening and thank you all for taking the time. And thank you to you, uh, Maria Lucia. Maria Lucia um, is the director of Arigato, which um, produces online materials um, on ethics education for children. And so she has a lot of expertise in this area and you will also be able to listen to her speak and present her ideas during the conference on the 25th. Um, we've reached the, the kind of formal conclusion of the session. And so anyone who has to go, you're very, um, you're excused. And at the same time yesterday, we, 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 we had the experience of staying behind just for a little moment of interaction and uh, announcements. And so you're invited to do that. I'm going to make a couple of announcements. And then you're invited to turn your, your mics off of mute and say hello and, and chat a little. And so a couple of announcements. Um, one of the topics that came up was, you know, a concern about you know, relying too much on, um, you know, on robots or AI and, you, you know, the, the human person and the human teacher and the human student are irreplaceable. And so how do we put these things together? And even before this COVID-19 moment, um, Globe Ethics was uh, you know, gathering experts to, to talk about these things because the rate of evolution is very quick. And now it's even sped up more, which is why there's a greater urgency. But I draw your attention to the fact that in our online library, we have lots of wonderful resources for download, for reading, and we have a course coming up on cyber ethics, an online course. And then I, I heard one question about the quality uh, of research work online, the quality of thesis submission. And this is a real issue, and it's being accented by the moment we're in now. And this is going to be the theme of our next uh, live chat. And so our next live chat is Sunday the 21st at the same time. And it's dealing with quality, online education for a sustainable future, quality and ethical standards in higher education. Our next chat after that is all found on the website, but just to review, 
um, Tuesday, the 23rd of June, same time, um, one hour, is a, a live chat on ethics and skills for responsible global leadership. Just acknowledging that the university is the place where we, we consider the pressing issues in our world and the values we want to have. That, that will be the topic. And then on the, the, the 24th, Wednesday, there will be a live chat and it will be an opportunity to hear from our online librarian and our publications um, platform um, to, to learn more about the work that Globe Ethics does and the resources we have to offer. Our, our conference is then on the 25th. And in the meantime, um, I hope you've all gone to the conference site, which is only available to registered participants. There you can read the papers and posters that participants have submitted. And there are discussion questions already proposed and a space for you to propose your own questions and interact with one another in another format. And we have reports of about over 100 um, interactions yesterday. So we hope that will increase and this will, yes, everyone is welcome to contribute and that's the purpose of it, to really facilitate as much exchange as possible. And so um, thank you so much for being with us. We look forward to seeing you again. Um, I think once again, we kind of want to continue, but let's just turn, we will continue into the next, on, into the discussion forum, into the next live chat. And as has been stated, this conference is meant to be part of a process leading us into working groups, research together, a, a kind of common discernment about where we can come together on, on the pressing and priority issues um, to propose some solutions and create some materials to, to speak into this situation. So I invite you all, you know, to turn off your mics and say, turn on your mics and, and say hello if you wish. And again, thank you so much for being with us. Hello. Hello. Thank you. Hello. 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 Hello.